Hello and welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to find the lore hidden within your Hearthstone deck. Last time we covered the Murlocs after the Murloc Knight won the community vote. This time I gave you a few different sorts of options. A series on the Dragon aspects, a random The Grand Tournament card, or our eventual winners, a new Barak and Ronin. Since he's first in the alphabet, not to mention one of my personal top 5 lore characters ever in the Warcraft universe, let's take a good hard look at the traitor king and rogue legendary himself, Anubarak. I am Anubarak. I ruled once before. I shall rule again. The art of the card is by Eric Braddock. He just recently celebrated working at Blizzard Entertainment for two years as a prop artist for World of Warcraft. Before this, Braddock worked as a freelance illustrator and taught at a community college. Braddock's favourite style is realism, and despite his career as a fantasy artist, you can see his love for this style permeating through a lot of his work, from portraits, to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, to his Warcraft work, all have at least a hint of realism. He predominantly paints in oils and digitally. Quite recently, Braddock has produced paintings of some key Warcraft lore characters. Gul'dan, Murad, Illyria, Medivh, and of course, Anubarak. The creature called Anubarak is known as the traitor king of the once great Nerubian kingdom, Ajol Nerub. Many thousands of years ago, the Nerubians were once part of a sentient insectoid race called the Akir. What we know of ancient Akir society comes from Titan records discovered by the great explorer Bram Bronzebeard. We cannot be certain how accurate these are, as there are other contradictory records. The Titans came to Azeroth and reshaped what was a world of chaos into one of order. This meant that some of the races already on the planet would have had origins unknown even to these godlike creatures. It is suspected that the Akir were created by entities known as the Old Gods. These gods revelled in chaos and ruled primordial Azeroth before the Titans came and sealed them away. The Old Gods formed the Akir from another creature. Whether that creature was an insect or an insect like humanoid is not certain. For example, some believe the Akir were evolved from the Silithid. But others believe that the Silithid were descendants of a later evolution of the Akir, the Karaji. The Akir were created with a singular purpose, to eradicate all non-insectoid life. Whichever origin is correct, after the Titan's reshaping of Azeroth, the Akir created their civilization of Azir-Kir in the deserts of southeastern Kalimdor, back when Azeroth was only a single landmass. Here, they would rise to become one of the three dominant empires of Azeroth. The other two empires belonged to the troll race, the Armani and the Guru Bashi. While the two troll empires had no love for each other, they had a common enemy in the Akir, who sought to aggressively expand their territory and kill all non-insectoids that dared get in their way. The war that broke out between these three empires would rage for thousands of years, neither side winning a decisive victory. Finally, 16,000 years before the present, the troll's persistence paid off. The Akir Empire split, some heading north, the others south. Those that travelled south would found the kingdom of An Kiraj in an old Titan research station and evolve to become the Karaji, while those who continued to travel further south to the region which would eventually become Pandaria would later evolve into the Mantid. Those Akir that travelled north to the region that would later become the frozen continent of Northrend found themselves in yet another war. Their opponent was the Tolvir, feline creatures with a humanoid torso and the lower body of a big cat, created by the Titans to guard their lore repositories and machinery. Some Tolvir would later become corrupted by the imprisoned old gods to become creatures of flesh and blood, but those that the Akir fought had bodies of stone. The Akir won out over the Tolvir, enslaved many of the race, and adapted their structures to suit their needs. The Akir that had settled in the northern parts of the world would later evolve into the spider-like Nerubians. It would appear the Nerubians' evolution was somewhat affected by those they had conquered. 
Tolvir architecture is modelled after ancient Egyptian structures in our world. High ranking the Rubians have features we commonly associate with the death masks of Egyptian pharaohs like Tutankhamun, or Tutankhamun, however you pronounce it. Nerubians come in all shapes and sizes. The most common are the spider like creatures that hatch from the Nerubian egg card in Hearthstone. Having said this, Hearthstone is not an accurate representation of how a Nerubian looks fresh from an egg. They begin their lives as spiderlings, similar to spiders but with fewer and bulkier legs. Spiderlings, while not as strong or intelligent as adult Nerubians, are still vicious and will often attack in swarms. After infancy, some Nerubians will go on to develop into flyers. This variety of Nerubian have eight legs with a skin-like membrane between them. The body remains similar to that of a spiderling, quite compact, but the flyers are able to fly with surprising speed, darting in and out of combat. Nerubian viziers stand upright, using four of their legs as a base, and the other four legs become arms. Viziers are tall, spindly, and will often specialise in magic. They are frequently venerated as seers among their people, and act as advisors to the most powerful Nerubians in their society. These powerful Nerubians were the Spider Lords, the variety to which Anubarak belongs. Often far more intelligent than those below them, and most certainly stronger, Spider Lords are easy to identify among the Nerubian ranks. As while they do still have spider-like qualities to their appearance, they more resemble giant beetles. The Spider Lord's carapace offers natural armour, and beneath the shell on their backs, they hide huge wings. The non-canon Warcraft RPG states that these wings cannot be used for flight. But, if Anubarak's representation in Heroes of the Storm is anything to go by, they can at least be used to allow the Spider Lord's massive body to hover above the ground. Spider Lords also allegedly lose their ability to spin webs. But again in HOTS, Anubarak seems to be capable of doing this, his trailer showing webbed victims and one of his ultimate abilities encasing his adversaries in silk. There is one other Nerubian type that is equal to, if not higher than a Spider Lord, a Queen. As well as being leaders, Queens also bear all Nerubian young. There have been no sightings of a Queen in World of Warcraft, but they were a powerful creature in Warcraft 3. Due to their importance, it is likely queens are hidden away. That is, if any still exist after the tragedy that struck the Nerubian race. It is thought that arachnithids, spiders and other arachnids are descendants of Nerubians. The former scorpion-like creatures used to be used as guardians by the Nerubians. Anubarak was king of the great Nerubian empire, Azul Nerub. Legend states that the Nerubians were able to tame the massive worm-like jawmongers using their ability to burrow great tunnels to create their sprawling subterranean kingdom, though the Nerubians are quite capable of tunnelling themselves. It is not stated when Anubarak became king of Azul Nerub, but under his leadership, the Nerubian Empire became the most prosperous in Northrend. Nerubian society is clearly civilised. While they as a species are ruthless, dominating rather than making allies, the Nerubians clearly have a reverence for knowledge and culture. They speak their own language, Nerubian. Some are well versed in magic. The architecture of Azul Nerub has detailed art traced across its walls, and according to the non-canon RPG, the Nerubians possess a library housing their knowledge that dwarves many other collections. To help non-WoW players understand the beauty of Nerubian architecture, I've done a little run of both dungeons in Azure Nerub, which you can view by clicking the annotations or the links in the description. Anubarak and the dominance of Azure Nerub went unquestioned in Northrend, until the arrival of a malevolent being, the Lich King. This frozen suit of armour held the soul of the once great orc shaman Ner'zhul. The orc's tortured spirit had been placed there by Kil'jaeden, a commander of the Burning Legion, to weaken Azeroth and allow the Legion a means to conquer the world. The Legion, led by the corrupted Titan Sargeras, sought to undo the work of the Titans, bringing chaos and destruction back to the worlds they had ordered. 
Kil'jaeden previously had manipulated the Orcs to his will, attempting to use them to weaken Azeroth. While this plan started well, infighting amongst the Orcish ranks saw them defeated by the Alliance. Kil'jaeden had designed the Lich King so that infighting would not be a problem and sent his Dreadlords to keep an eye on their Zul. After all, the process of being turned into the Lich King against his will was not a pleasant one. Despite not being able to move from his frozen throne, Ner'zhul's psychic and necromantic abilities were greatly increased. Ner'zhul reached out to dominate the minds of the local lifeforms. As well as this, a plague seeped from his frozen throne, turning those dominated into mindless undead, allowing Ner'zhul to feed on their souls and become even stronger. There were, however, some that stood in the way of the Lich King turning Northrend into his icy kingdom, Anubarak and the Nerubian Empire. Not only were the Nerubians powerful and hostile to those that challenged their power, they were also immune to the Lich King's psychic abilities and his plague. Anubarak recognised the Lich King as a serious threat to his kingdom and launched an attack on the ruler of the dam's frozen throne. This first meeting would escalate in a 10 year long war fought between the Nerubians and the start of what would later become known as the Undead Scourge, the War of the Spider. Anubarak, despite his formidable physical strength, chose to fight with cunning as opposed to brawn. The Nerubians implemented guerrilla tactics against the Scourge, whittling down the Lich King's forces with hit and run attacks. Anubarak knew that in a head-on assault, the Nerubians were at a disadvantage. The use of these tactics was so effective that the Nerubians pulled ahead in the war. This is perhaps why Anubarak was chosen as a rogue card rather than a warrior. While he is an extremely powerful warrior, he is also adept at springing ambushes and taking his enemy by surprise. While the war was going well, a series of events would transpire against the Nerubians. The Lich King found their greatest subterranean kingdom, Ajol Nerub. The Lich King sent a giant host of undead, along with the Dreadlords, in an attempt to destroy the Nerubians once and for all. Even with his own kingdom threatened, Anubarak was happy to take a more indirect approach, knowing a head-on collision would spell doom for his people, burrowing deeper into the earth and giving up ground to allow the Nerubians' room to hit back at the Scourge. Again, a tactic that worked in the spider's favour. The Lich King's forces were near unending, for while the Nerubians were resistant to the plague and mind control, after death they could still be risen as servants of the Lich King, becoming more powerful in undeath. These risen Nerubians were known as Crypt Fiends. The Nerubians kept digging and digging until they had dug too far. They stumbled across a prison created by the Titans that held servants of the Old Gods, the Faceless Ones. Now fighting a war on two fronts, the Nerubians found themselves in a situation that they could not win. Almost the entirety of Azul Nerub's inhabitants were mercilessly killed and risen once again as servants to the Scourge. One of those that lost their life during the War of the Spider was Anubarak himself and was risen once again as a Crypt Lord. Anubra Khan, one of Anubarak's most loyal commanders, shared the same fate and could later be found stationed in Naxxramas. Like other Nerubian victims, Undeath increased Anubarak's physical strength, and unlike many other servants of the Lich King, the Nerubians are still lucid. Their intelligence is far greater than the shambling host making up the majority of the Scourge. Most undead Nerubians do not wish to commit the will of the Lich King, but have no choice, being forced to action. With the Lich King's domination over his will, Anubarak was forced into attacking his own people. With Azul Nerub routed, all that was left was to clean up any Nerubian resistance to the Lich King in Northrend. Anubarak led the charge, his name becoming infamous, and the once great ruler was labelled the Traitor King. Despite their resistance, the Lich King held respect for his once adversaries. 
Each ziggurat and the Rubian structure claimed by Anubarak and his fellow Crypt Lords were repurposed to suit the needs of the Scourge, and the architecture would later influence the appearance of the Scourge's own buildings. Seeing that the Lich King had dominated Northrend and pleased that his experiment had been a success, Kiljaden and his Dreadlords thought it was time the Lich King extended his territory to the continent of the Eastern Kingdoms. Knowing that conquering the human kingdom of Lordaeron would be a lot harder than merely sending the Scourge in boats to attack, the Lich King hatched the plan. If the Scourge attacked from the shore, the humans would be able to build a resistance. Ner'zhul needed someone to take them down from the inside. He reached out to powerful individuals that lusted power, and Archmage Kel'Thuzad answered his call. Braving the cold of Northrum by himself, Kel'Thuzad arrived at a citadel that had been conquered by Anubarak, which once belonged to the Nerubian race, Naxxramas. The two silent crypt fiends that guarded the entrance stepped aside, allowing Kel'Thuzad to enter. Not long after entering, a huge behemoth strode towards Kel'Thuzad. The powerful Archmage doubted he could even defeat this creature in combat, let alone raise it as an undead servant. The unknown entity that had contacted him must have been very powerful. The giant greeted Kel'Thuzad. The master has been expecting you, Archmage. I am a new Barak. Kalthazard had dabbled in necromancy, reviving rats that could barely function. The fact that the Lich King had the skill to revive a Nubarak and that the Nerubians still had the capacity for speech amazed the mage. Kalthazard looked to become the Lich King's apprentice. A Nubarak warned him he may not be up to the task. Not wishing to appear weak in front of what the mage had assumed was the Lich King's major domo, he assured a Nubarak he was. It is in conversation with Kalthazard that Anubarak reveals the torment he must now suffer. In return for immortality, you agreed to serve him. Agreed implies choice. Anubarak showed Kalthazard around Naxxramas, introducing him to each of the four quarters we see in Hearthstone. The final room had cauldrons filled with bubbling greenish liquid. As Kalthazard went to look inside one of the cauldrons, Anubarak stopped him. He informed Kalthazard that the master still wanted him alive. The mage was clearly stunned that the liquid could have killed him if not for Anubarak, and the Crypt Lord chose to show the mage the liquid's properties. Anubarak explained that there were many who did not wish to serve the master in life, and that the green liquid resolved that issue. Anubarak led Kalthazard to a cell, a weeping woman and her husband trapped within. Anubrak explained that the woman would soon become a slave to the master, whether she wanted to or not. Recognising Kalthazard was a mage, the tearful woman begged him to incinerate her body. When he did not answer her, she continued to howl, asking him to at least take her husband to safety. Distressed by the woman's cries, Kalthazard told Anubarak to make her be quiet. In a flash, Anubarak's claw had darted through the bars of the cell and impaled the woman straight through the heart. The woman's limp body fell to the floor, her skin greyed, and she began to twitch back to life. She leapt upon her husband, tearing him to shreds. As she did so, Kalthazard could hear a mournful groan coming from the woman and realised with horror that she was still aware of her actions, forced to tear apart the man she loved. Sickened and realising the Lich King meant to conquer, Kel'Thuzad teleported away. Very soon after, he was captured and would end up serving the Lich King. Since Anubrak and the other Scourge had finished the preparations within, Naxxramas was hoisted from the ground to become Kel'Thuzad's floating base of operations. Kel'Thuzad travelled to the Eastern Kingdoms, Anubarak remaining behind in Northrend, a powerful enforcer of the Lich King's will on his home turf. Kalthazard would use the plague cauldrons within the Kingdom of Lordaeron, causing an epidemic of undeath that would see the kingdom fall to the Scourge. While Anubarak remained in Northrend, many things happened on the continents of the Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor. The human prince Arthas took up the blade Frostmourne and became the Lich King's champion. 
Kel'Thuzad became a lich, the elven kingdom of Quel'Thalas was destroyed by Arthas and the Scourge, and the Burning Legion were able to launch their invasion. However, the Legion's attack failed, partially due to the betrayal of Ner'Zhul. Arthas was able to convince the recently freed Illidan to consume the power of the Skull of Gul'dan making the Night Elf strong enough to dispatch one of the Legion's most powerful generals, Tychondrius. Without Tychondrius' forces, the Legion's final attack failed. Furious his creation had betrayed him at the 11th hour, Kil'jaeden sought to destroy the Lich King. Shunned by his people for consuming the skull, Illidan was given a chance to escape Kil'jaeden's wrath if he destroyed Ner'Zhul. Illidan's first plan failed. He tried to use a powerful magical artifact to destroy the continent of Northrend entirely, with aid from the Naga, but was stopped by his brother Malfurion, as Illidan's actions were making Azeroth itself cry out in pain. Fearful of what Kil'jaeden might do to him, Illidan fled, accepting the Blood Elves into his ranks. These Elves were the remnants of the High Elves after the Scourge's assault on Quel'Thalas, led by Prince Kael'thas Sunstrider. They had renamed themselves the Blood Elves in honour of their fallen kin. Illidan was foolish to run, as Kil'jaeden tracked him down with ease. But the mighty Lord of the Legion did not strike him down, and offered Illidan one more chance to destroy the Lich King. Illidan's initial attack had weakened Ner'Zhul, and as a result he had begun to lose his grip on some of the Scourge in the Eastern Kingdoms. He could now sense Illidan's forces approaching to put an end to his reign. As Arthas was linked to the Lich King through Frostmourne, he too began to weaken. Keen to save his master and regain his waning powers, Arthur set out with an undead force to Northrend, leaving his right-hand man, Kel'Thuzad, to enforce the Lich King's authority in the Eastern Kingdoms. The Lich King turned to Anubarak to organise defences for his throne and ensure that Arthas made it for the final battle against Illidan and his allies. Anubarak was once again compelled to obey. He left many of his finest warriors at the base of the frozen spire that housed the Lich King's throne and set out himself to meet with Arthas upon his arrival. Illidan's forces arrived before Arthas, but Anubarak was able to reach his destination with relative ease. When he arrived, Arthas and his forces were already there, the self-proclaimed King of Lordaeron's situation looking bleak. Something out there is threatening the Lich King. We must reach Ice Crown quickly. My King, we'll need to establish a base here first, but this island is nearly devoid of resources. What the? They look like High Elves. What are they doing here? Prince Arthas, we are the Blood Elves. We have sworn to avenge the ghosts of Quel'Thalas. This dead land will be cleansed. Northrend belongs to the Scourge, Elf. You made a terrible mistake by coming here. Slay them! Onward for the Scourge. Slay them in Ner'Zhul's name. Who the... Thanks for the assistance, Mighty One. The Lich King sent me to aid you, Death Knight. I am Anubarak, ancient king of Ajol Nerub. I welcome your aid, Anubarak, but we have little time for pleasantries. We must reach Ice Crown immediately. Thanks to Anubarak and his crypt fiends, Arthas easily dispatched the Blood Elves. A good thing too, as Arthas' anti-air forces were thin. Not wasting any time, Anubarak and Arthas led an attack on a nearby Blood Elven base, constructing one of their own upon the ruins. Despite this victory, Prince Kael'thas arrived to gloat. Anubarak and Arthas had only beaten a small scouting force, and Illidan's vast army of Naga and Blood Elves already marched towards the throne of the Lich King located in the region of Ice Crown. With a sneer, Kael told Arthas, consider this payment for Quel'Thalas, and teleported away. Arthas knew there was no way that his forces would reach the Lich King in time, but Anubarak had a plan. The Crypt Lord suggested that Arthas lead his forces through the ruined kingdom of Azul Narub, 
Anubarak warned the route would be fraught with danger, traps, creatures and unknown risks lying in wait. Arthas did have the perfect guide in Anubarak, the kingdom's old ruler, and this dangerous path offered a more direct route to Icecrown, allowing the undead to catch up to Illidan's forces. Seeing there was no other option, Arthas quickly agreed to Anubarak's plan. As Arthas and Anubarak prepared their army to smash through the elven and naga forces that lay between them and the kingdom's entrance, Anubarak had another suggestion. Close to their base was the lair of a mighty blue dragon, Sapphiron. Blue dragons were trusted by the titans to keep watch over the magic and magical artefacts of Azeroth when the titans left. Sapphiron was no different, keeping a horde of magical items away from those that may abuse them. Even when the Lich King held domination over much of Northrend, Sapphiron's stash had not been looted. Anubarak knew that his people gave Arthas the edge he needed to defeat the dragon. While forces were trained back at the base, Arthas and Anubarak took a small force to slay Sapphiron. The crypt fiends entangled the dragons in their webs, causing them to crash to the ground and allowing the scourge forces to tear them apart. With Sapphiron slain, Arthas laid claim to his artefacts, and using the power he still possessed, raised Sapphiron as a monstrous frostworm. With the power of Sapphiron added to the attack, Anubarak and Arthas were easily able to cut a path through the Naga and Blood Elves to Azul Narub. The fighting did not stop there. Upon reaching the gates of the kingdom, the undead found their way blocked by dwarves who had taken up residence within. These dwarves despised Arthas, for he had been responsible for the death of their leader, Muradin, who much later turned out not to be dead. Muradin was sacrificed to allow Arthas to lay claim to Frostmourne. Arthas relied heavily on Anubarak to guide him through Azul Narub. Despite the dwarves' best efforts to stop them, even blowing up a bridge, Anubarak was able to find an alternate route. The Scourge slaughtered the dwarves and the unturned Nerubians that still called Azil Narub home. When they finally found the dwarven leader, Bailgun, the dwarf had a foreboding message before his death. I remember you, evil prince. You're the one that killed poor Muradin. Get over it already. I won't let you through this door, traitor. The recent quakes have awakened dark things under the ice. Ancient horrid things. We vowed to keep them locked where they are. We'll take our chances, Dwarf. We're going through that door, one way or another. Anubarak and Arthas ventured further into Azul Narub, a foul stench emanating from the depths. It would not be long until they encountered the dreaded creatures that lay in wait. The tremors that still lingered from Illidan's first attack on Icecrown had once again awakened the servants of the old gods, the Faceless Ones. Anubarak thought that the creatures were only legend, perhaps indicating that he fell in the War of the Spider before the Nerubians stumbled across their ancient prison. Anubarak was also shocked to discover the being that led the Faceless Ones. A forgotten one, a putrid, fleshy mound whose unending number of tentacles would pierce through the ground to attack its opponents. It's still not entirely clear what this creature was, as there has only ever been one in the history of the Warcraft franchise. Is it merely a powerful servant of the old gods, or perhaps one itself? After a battle that tested Anubarak and Arthas to their limits, the forgotten one was destroyed. Anubarak and Arthas ventured on, but were separated when a tremor caused a cave-in, Arthas being left alone. Knowing that the Lich King's champion may not survive without his guidance through the trap-laden passages, Anubarak and his crypt fiends began to frantically burrow through the earth. Anubarak was relieved to discover after burrowing through the rubble that Arthas had survived. He was even impressed by the Death Knight's resilience. Arthas had been able to navigate several traps and come out unscathed, and Uberak could see why the Lich King had chosen him as his champion. The tremors had become more frequent, and Arthas and Anubarak ran as fast as they could to escape the imminent mass cave-in, which they did by the skin of their teeth. Having made it through Azul Narub, Arthas and Anubarak prepped themselves for the final part of their journey.
We've made it in Uberak. Our forces are already assembled and waiting. Greetings, King Arthas. You've arrived just in time. Illidan's Naga and Blood Elf forces have taken up positions at the base of the glacier and- Arthas, my champion. You have come at last. Master? There is a fracture in my prison, the Frozen Throne. And my energies are seeping from it. That is why your powers have diminished. But how? The room that made Frostlorn was once locked inside the throne as well. I thrust it from the ice so that it would find its way to you and then lead you to me. And so it has. For now, we face a grave danger. My creator, the demon lord Kil'jaeden, sent his agents here to destroy me. If they should reach the frozen throne before you, all will be lost. The scourge will be undone. Now hurry, I will grant you all the power I can spare. I saw another vision of the Lich King. He has restored my powers. I know now what I must do. It's time to end the game. Once and for all. Time's running out, Anubarak. We've got to get inside the throne chamber before Illidan does. The throne chamber lies within the frozen peak at the center of the valley. It can only be opened by activating the four enchanted obelisks that surround it. Illidan's forces have already entrenched themselves near two of them. We'll need to drive them back and reactivate the obelisks ourselves. With the mighty Anubarak defending him from the likes of Illidan, Kale, and the Naga leader, Lady Vash, Arthas activated the obelisks and made his way to the entrance of the Frozen Throne. Here, he met in battle with Illidan and came out triumphant, leaving his opponent to bleed out in the snow. Anubarak watched as the champion of Ner'zhul strode up the stairs of the Frozen Throne, smashed Ner'zhul's prison and placed the Lich King's helm upon his head. Arthas and the Lich King were now one and the same, entering a deep sleep to recuperate his power. As the Lich King slept, Anubarak travelled back to his old kingdom, once again claiming it as his own in the name of the Scourge. Here he would remain until the Lich King's awakening and heroes of Azeroth travelled to Northrun to put an end to the Lich King once and for all. To defeat the Lich King, the Alliance and Horde knew that the King's most powerful allies must also fall. One of the first they looked to hunt down was Anubarak. As the adventurers travelled into the depths of the earth, they found the Rubians fighting each other. Some were the forces of Anubarak but the others had not been claimed by the Lich King. The heroes aided the living Nerubians, and their leader, Kilix the Unraveler, asked for their aid. What remained of the living Nerubians were doing their best to liberate their kingdom of the Scourge, and finally bring the traitor king to justice. Kilix regarded Anubarak with disgust, the king turning the place he once called home into a perverse squalor, rotting Nerubians, traipsing its halls. What was left of the Nerubian race was led by the remaining Viziers, using their knack for tactical thinking to guide their people as best they could. Kilix looked to cleanse the kingdom of Ajol Nerub of the two groups that had blighted its hallways since the War of the Spider, the Scourge and the Faceless Ones. The heroes agreed to aid Kilix and ventured into Anubarak's lair. Before the heroes could even enter the Traitor King's domain, they needed to eliminate Krikthir, the Gatewatcher. The Vizier had guarded the unbreached gates of Ajil Narub right up until the arrival of the Scourge. For his failings, he now guarded the gate in Undeath too. 
the heroes fought through his guards and attacked the vizier himself. Krikthir summoned legions of poisonous insects to swarm the heroes, but they eventually won out. The vizier's chamber was also filled with eggs that Kilix had asked the heroes to destroy. These Nerubian eggs had been corrupted using the dark energies of the Scourge. The young were bred only to be slaughtered and risen again to bolster the Lich King's forces. Rather than subject the Nerubian young to this fate, the adventurers gladly destroyed the eggs. As the party passed through the gates, they were presented with a chaotic scene, undead Nerubians trying their best to subdue a giant spider. This spider had been released by the Viziers during the War of the Spider to one day grow to a massive size and avenge the fallen Nerubians. It seems that Hadronox's time had come, but as it slaughtered the undead, in its frenzy, it also attacked the heroes, a mistake that cost the spider its life. Finally, the heroes came to Anubarak's throne chamber, who greeted them with a bitter welcome. I was king of this empire once, long ago. In life, I stood as champion. In death, I returned as conqueror. Now I protect the kingdom once more. Ironic, yes? The heroes charged the king, who fought with unwavering ferocity. Anubarak's blows were so powerful, they made his adversaries cower. He summoned locusts to tear at their flesh and heal himself. He burrowed under the ground, shooting spikes up at his opponents, and the Nerubians of Ashul Nerub flocked to the defence of their king. Despite all of this, he was defeated. In death, a relief washed over Anubarak, which could be heard in his dying words. Never thought I would be free of him. Many thought Anubarak would no longer plague Northrend, and with the defeat but not death of Kel'Thuzad, the Alliance and Horde prepared to take on the Lich King. The great paladin Tyrion Fordring held a tournament to help pick the best heroes for the task of attacking the Lich King's bastion, Ice Crown Citadel. Many flocked to the Argent tournament in an attempt to prove their worthiness. Some were picked to endure the toughest challenge the Argent tournament had for them, the Trial of the Crusader. Champions fought the strongest beasts of Northrend, a demon of the Burning Legion, champions of the Alliance, and two of the strongest agents of the Lich King. As Tyrion congratulated the heroes on a job well done, the chilling voice of the Lich King filled the air. There is no challenge that we cannot face united! You will have your challenge, Fordring. Arthas, you are hopelessly outnumbered. Lay down Frostmourne and I will grant you a just death. <laughs> the Nerubians built an empire beneath the frozen wastes of Northrend. An empire that you so foolishly built your structures upon. My empire souls of your fallen champions will be mine for drink. Oh, our guests have arrived just as the master promised. A new Barak had risen again, even more powerful than before, and this time he appeared to have lost all pretense of sanity. As before, Anubarak would unleash his leeching swarm of locusts and summon other Nerubians to aid him. This time, however, he was far more powerful and the Lich King had imbued the Crypt Lord with the capability of using ice-based abilities. Yet again, Anubarak was defeated, screaming, I have failed you, master, as he fell. The art of Anubarak's Hearthstone card is based on this iteration of the Traitor King, and since the Grand Tournament is on the same grounds as the Argent Tournament, this was the perfect time to introduce Anubarak to Hearthstone. So, there you have it, the lore behind one of my personal favourite Warcraft characters. I really hope I did him justice, and that you guys can see why Anubarak is so popular among fans. Liking, subscribing, and sharing really helps us out a lot. 
and it makes me think you're awesome. Of course, if you hit the dislike button, I'll just assume you're really into the lore, starting your own treacherous little empire. Anubarak would be proud. If you've enjoyed the art, all the artists I could find are linked in the description below, and I really encourage you to check out more of their work. If you have any comments for what you'd like to see from the channel, future episodes of Lore of the Cards, or just want to chat, I try to respond to pretty much all of them, leave a comment in the comments section.